Good morning and welcome to this first session of Saturday morning of the conference. My name is Father Kevin Grove. I'm a Holy Cross priest and an assistant professor in the Department of Theology here on campus. It's a joy to welcome you here to this panel, Seeking Understanding Persons in the Early Church. Um, we are minus our third speaker with just a question mark around uh, his status at the moment. So I will do the introductions and we will, if he comes, which, is, which would be the most ideal, uh, we'll add him and move him to third. Uh, that's Pablo Irizar um, from Newman Theological College. So we're going to switch the order just a bit and begin with Joshua McManaway and then John Seahorn. So I'll introduce all three at this point. We'll have um, all three presentations or at least two. Um, and then time at the end for the remainder of our panel um, for questions. So, uh, and you'll be able to ask questions of um, each of our speakers individually or as a whole. So let me start with the inf insufficiency of the concept of person in the theology of Nestorius of Constantinople. And this is given by Do Dr. Josh McManaway from here at the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Josh McManaway is an assistant professor of the practice in the McGrath Institute for Church Life here at Notre Dame, where he teaches regularly in the theology department. His research focuses pr principally on the thought of early and medieval Christian thinkers. His dissertation, Nestorius Latinus, the Latin reception of the critique of Nestorius of Constantinople, is a study of how Latin authors from the 5th through 9th centuries conceived of and critiqued Nestorianism. With John Cavadini, he has recently completed a translation of two of Alcuin of York's theological treatises, which will be published by Catholic University of America Press. He holds a BA in Classics from East Carolina University and an MA in Early Christian Studies and PhD in Theology, History of Christianity, from here at the University of Notre Dame. Our second speaker today is going to be Dr. John Seahorn with a presentation entitled Divine Worship and Human Personhood in the Fathers of the Church. And John Seahorn is the academic dean of the Augustan Institute Graduate School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. He specializes in the theology of the Fathers of the Church with a particular interest in their scriptural exegesis. He received his doctorate from here, the University of Notre Dame, and has been a member of the faculty of the Augustan Institute since 2015. He is currently co-editing the book series, A Catholic Biblical Theology of the Sacraments for Baker Academic. And our third speaker, Deo Valente, will be Pablo Irizar, with a presentation called Seven Models of Personhood in Patristic Literature an integrative approach to the human person as the image of God. And Professor Irizar, born and raised in Mexico City, is Vice President, Academic Dean, and Professor of Theology at Newman Theological College. He has previously served as holder of the endowed Kennedy Smith Chair in Catholic Studies at McGill in Montreal. He holds a PhD in Theology from KU Leuven and a PhD in Philosophy from the Catholic University of Paris. He writes, teaches, and researches at the intersection of philosophy, theology, and intellectual history. So with that, please join me in welcoming our first presenter today, Dr. Josh McManaway. Thank you, Father Kevin, and thank you all for being here. When Nestorius took up the episcopacy in Constantinople in April of 428, few could have seen the controversy he would catalyze in the capital city of the empire. He had been recruited away from his monastery outside of Antioch by the Emperor Theodosius II because factions had arisen in Constantinople around two Episcopal hopefuls, two priests, both from the capital city, whose followers in good Christian fashion hated one another. <laughs> Theodosius' choice of Nestorius was meant as something of a compromise that would satisfy either both or neither of the indigenous parties. But Nestorius was not content to fulfill the role of peacemaker. Almost immediately from the outset of his episcopacy, Nestorius showed that he was a firebrand. The fifth century historian Socrates Scholasticus says that before even tasting of the city's water, Nestorius went about persecuting various heretical groups, such as the Manichaeans and Arians, who, though technically outlawed, were harmless enough that the citizens of Constantinople had left them alone. Not Nestorius. He was zealous to cleanse the city of these dissidents and promised the Emperor Theodosius in his first homily with the emperor in attendance that if Theodosius would help him cleanse the city of heretics, 
Nestorius would intercede with God to hand victory over the Persians to him. Of course, the main controversy for which Nestorius is known arose when he preached his most famous sermon against the title Theotokos, or God-bearer, or Mother of God, in defense of an alternative title for Mary, Christotokos, or Mother of Christ. This title, argued Nestorius, was fitting because Christ is an appropriate name for the union of the divinity of the Logos and the humanity of Jesus that preserves scripture's commitment to diaphysitism, whereas Theotokos veered into pagan myth-making as though the Lord were like Zeus, impregnating human women through devious means. No, says Nestorius, God has no mother. Because the debate began with denouncing a traditional Marian title, people sometimes think that the Nestorian controversy has more to do with her. But much as the Filioque controversy is not about the Holy Spirit, neither is the controversy surrounding the title Theotokos about Mary. She figures very little into the dispute after this homily, except in that the denial of this title has major Christological ramifications that Nestorius' interlocutor sees upon. Indeed, the whole of the Nestorian debate hinges upon the meaning of the word person. What is a person, and how is Jesus Christ one? Let us attend to Nestorius' answer to this question. First, I want to briefly sketch out the contours of his Christological thought. After this, I will speak especially to Nestorius' understanding of the word prosopon, a Greek word often translated as person. Whereas many of Nestorius' more sympathetic readers in the 20th century were inclined to interpret Nestorius' prosopon as Cyril of Alexandria's hypostasis, I will show that Nestorius cannot mean anything close to hypostasis when he uses the word prosopon. In addition to this, I will argue that Nestorius does not use the word prosopon univocally every time, but rather has two separate meanings that he switches between when speaking of the individual natures of Christ and the resultant prosopon of the union of the two natures. Prosopon thus becomes coordinate with nature with some minor caveats, which I will discuss. Let's try to get a handle on some of the facets of Nestorius's Christological thought. First, Nestorius is a committed diophysite. That is, he believes there are two natures in Christ, duo fusus, one human and one divine. He appeals to the Philippian hymn, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, as a governing text for his diaphysitism and claims that Paul teaches us to read scripture so that now we see the form of the servant, i.e. the humanity, and now the form of God, i.e. the divinity. Christ has both a divine and a human nature, or ousia in Greek, and these natures retain their characteristic properties even after the incarnation, and neither impinges upon the other. Rather, Nestorius prefers to speak of presence. The divinity remains present to the humanity of Jesus, much like God was present in the temple of Israel. One could destroy the temple as the Babylonians had in the 6th century BC or the Romans in 70 AD without destroying God because God was not the temple. By this particular presence in Jesus, God's presence to humanity more generally is disclosed. God uses the instrument of the human Jesus to make manifest his salvific activity in the world. This presence is, as Nestorius says in his last work titled The Book of Heraclides, this presence is much like, if not exactly like, God's presence to Adam originally, who lost it through his own disobedience. The vision of salvation Nestorius offers in his homilies is that of a morally upright human Jesus defeating the claims of the devil by willing to live a sinless life, aided by divinity's enduring presence. Humanity had fallen in Adam, and humanity, aided by the divine presence, had to succeed in Christ. While reading through Nestorius' texts, one notices that he prefers to speak of the abstract nature rather than concrete individuals. He will very often refer to the divinity rather than the logos himself when speaking of the incarnation. For instance, in Sermon 3, he complains about Cyril of Alexandria's Christology. Nestorius alleges that Cyril laughably believes that the Father sent divinity, which is impossible. But Nestorius teaches that the Father sent humanity. But notice the issue here. Nestorius believes a nature, not a person, is sent. His Eucharistic position is much the same. As Nestorius remarks in Sermon 4, Christ did not say, take, eat, this is my divinity. Rather, he told us to eat his body, 
which belongs to the humanity. In his argument against Mary's being called Theotokos, Nestorius makes the point that divinity, deitas or theotes, cannot be born, but rather humanity, humanitas or anthropotes, is. In Sermon 8, again, it is the anthropophusis or human nature that is born to Mary, while divinity is conjoined to the man. Theodore of Mopsuestia, Nestorius' teacher in the faith, a household name I know, had even gone so far as to say that were the divinity to decide to leave the man Jesus at any point, a separate human subject would perdure. This is only theoretically possible, argues Theodore, because the union of the two natures is predicated upon God's good will, and that is everlasting. Nevertheless, the two natures are separate enough so as to functionally be individual subjects of predication, who, were they theoretically separated from each other after the incarnation, would exist independent of one another. You'd have a divinity walking around and a humanity walking around. Nestorius denies this as a possibility, but only because, again, of God's good will, and not on the basis of some integration of the two natures in a union that is now separable. Like Theodore before him, Nestorius also believes that each nature involved in the incarnation has its own prosopon. That is to say that the humanity has its own prosopon and the divinity likewise its own. Notice I'm refusing to translate the word. I'm not saying person. I'm going to keep saying prosopon. Frederick MacLeod has uh, argued that in Theodore's theology, there is little distinction between what can be attributed to the prosopon of divinity and the nature of divinity. This has to do with weak Trinitarian distinctions common in Antiochian theology, and I can say more in the Q&A if anyone's interested. But in addition to the prosopon of the nature, there is also what Nestorius and Theodore both call the prosopon of the union. There are thus, according to both of them, two prosopa, the plural, of the natures, united in a single prosopon of the union. Alert listeners will have noticed a problem. How are there two prosopa in a single prosopon? How do two x exist in a single x? Sure, two x may exist in a y, but to say that two x's exist in a single x while all variables remain x uh, makes little logical sense. This is the shore upon which much Nestorian scholarship has run aground. Many scholars have opted to hit this beach and insist that they are still sailing along smoothly. No problem here. Friedrich Luefs punts on the question entirely by saying that Nestorius is not a metaphysical thinker, and any attempts at a metaphysical account of personhood are an imposition on Nestorius's thought. This is maybe an attractive solution, but a pyrrhic one. It's hard to imagine what an ah metaphysical account of personhood even looks like. Or another solution is offered by Milton Anastas in his cryptically titled article, Nestorius was Orthodox, who maintains that Nestorius must simply mean by prosopon what Cyril means by hypostasis. Without even defining prosopon, however, one may discern a problem in this interpretation. Cyril's Christology does not have two hypostases, a human and a divine, joining together in another hypostasis. Rather, the hypostasis of the divine logos assumes to himself another nature, a human one, and joins it hypostatically to himself. The hypostasis of the logos is the locus of the incarnation for Cyril, but neither the prosopon of the human nature nor the prosopon of the divinity can be said to be the locus of the incarnation for Nestorius. What then is a prosopon for Nestorius? I offer my own definition. A prosopon is the outward manifestation of the characteristics, the idiomata in Greek, appropriate to a given nature. I'll say it again. A prosopon is the outward manifestation of the characteristics appropriate to a given nature. First, it's important to note that prosopon belongs more to the realm of phenomena than ontology. Whereas hypostasis has a rich, complicated, and philosophical history, Prosopon belongs to the history of the stage. Uh, prosopeion was at first the name of the mask that actors would wear on stage, but became a, a common word to describe the very role or character they played. Right? It was the mask that you wore as an actor. During the rise of Sibelianism, the Sibelians capitalized on the ambiguous meaning of the word prosopon and argued that the father, son, and spirit were not hypostases, which seemed too individuating and unmonotheistic, and that they were instead prosopa, 
or phenomenological manifestations of the one God. God would thus be one, and he would put on his father mask at times, his son mask at others, and the Holy Spirit mask when it suited him. The word prosopon was therefore theologically suspect already by the fifth century, which had begun to prefer the language of hypostasis in its newer meaning as concrete instance of a nature. While Nestorius was no modalist, he rarely uses the language of hypostasis and only brings up the word when an anti-Aryan argument requires that he stop speaking of the more abstract divinity and begin to speak about the individual persons of the Trinity. When Nestorius moves from Trinitarian arguments to Christological ones, he always uses the language of prosopon. For Nestorius, the prosopon discloses the characteristics of the nature to which it belongs. We can see that Jesus of Nazareth has a human nature precisely because his prosopon does human things. He is born, eats, sleeps, cries over his dead friend, prays, dies. Were Jesus to manifest these visible idiomata without there being a corresponding human nature, as Nestorius believes the Manichaeans teach, this would be a lie, which Nestorius says is en schema. To be in schema, as opposed to in nature, is a false manifestation of the idiomata, the characteristics, without the appropriate underlying nature. When there is a genuine prosopon of a genuine nature, then a thing can be known by the visible manifestation of appropriate characteristics. These phenomena not only disclose what a thing is, that is a tree over there, but that it is a particular thing. It is this tree and not the other tree. So prosopa for Nestorius not only disclose the nature of something, but individuate it. In Christ, the two natures with their prosopa are joined together in a sunafia, a conjunction that Nestorius calls the prosopon of the union. Here we arrive at Nestorius's second meaning of the word prosopon. Unlike Cyril's hypostasis, the prosopon of the union is not the term of the incarnation. It is not the locus of the conjunction of the two natures but merely the naming of the reality of their being joined together, or better, of being present to one another. Divinity is close to the humanity in the man Jesus in a superabundant way, and it is precisely on the basis of this superabundance that Nestorius denies the charge of teaching that the prosopon of the humanity is a mere man. The human prosopon is indeed a subject of attribution, an agent whose actions are in some sense independent, but Nestorius believes that by virtue of the privilege of his relationship with divinity, Jesus cannot be called mere man. Whereas each of the prosopa in Christ have underlying natures, human and divine, the prosopon of the union has no underlying nature. There is no there there. Rather, the prosopon of the union is, I argue, merely a grammatical category employed by Nestorius to provide a proximate subject of attribution when talking about the life of Christ, but not an ultimate one. It is there to preserve the economy of salvation in the work of Christ. Or as Carl Broughton says, it is Nestorius's way of speaking about the undivided appearance of the historical Jesus. Who cried outside the tomb of Lazarus? Christ, but actually the humanity. Who healed the man born blind in John's gospel? Christ, but really the divinity. For Nestorius, Christ is never the ultimate subject of attribution. You can always back it up to one of the natures. Similarly, Nestorius speaks of worshiping the human Jesus alongside the divinity as a co-worker of divine authority. But as Nestorius says in Sermon 8, no one should think that Christianity worships a man. How scandalous. We see that there are ultimately two subjects of attribution here. The divinity, who is worthy of worship by nature, as well as the humanity who is, Nestorius says, given worship alongside the divinity, because the prosopon of divinity has granted this honor. The prosopon of the union, I've said prosopon so many times, it doesn't sound like a real word anymore. <laughs> it is though, it's written here. The prosopon of the union presents to the senses a single quasi subject for worship, even though the intellect is able to abstract the two natures therefrom and discern which of the two is the actual subject of worship and which is merely along for the ride. Later in the book of Heraclides, Nestorius even says explicitly that in actuality, it is the prosopon of the divinity alone that properly receives worship. Anything one can say of the figure Christ is ultimately able to be backed up to one of the two natures. Who was born and died? Christ, but really the humanity. Who saved us? Christ, but ultimately the divinity. 
The prosopon of the divinity may even share with the prosopon of humanity his titles, like son of God, as well as his glory and honor, but their identities and activities must remain distinct. The two subjects in Christ, the humanity and the divinity, have an integrity to their existence that is lacking in the prosopon of the union. There is no nature which could give rise to a prosopon of union, and so it must be fundamentally different from the prosopa, which are expressive of natures. There cannot therefore be a communicatio idiomatum, as in Cyril's hypostatic union, but only a communicatio nominum, a communication of titles, where we get to share titles. The titles of the logos can be shared with the human Jesus, but their activities and characteristics are distinct, as I said. Nestorius charges Cyril with, with assigning to the nature of the word of God the idiomata of both divinity and humanity. But since idiomata, these characteristics, are for Nestorius disclosive of an underlying nature, it would make no sense for one nature to share its idiomata with another nature. To do so would mean that a nature is manifesting characteristics totally foreign to it, which Nestorius considers to be a falsehood unbefitting God. The shared idiomata would either point to a nature which does not actually exist, or in the case of Jesus, would signal that the two natures had combined into a tertium quid, a third thing, which is the implication of Nestorius' charge against Cyril. Right? He believes Cyril's Christ is neither human nor divine, but a weird mashup. The most important takeaway here is that the prosopon of the union is never the ultimate subject of attribution in Nestorius' thought. One can always back up the level of predication to either of the two natures. Nestorius' Christology is hamstrung by his deficient concept of person. He has, in many senses, failed to account for the radical implications of the Incarnation, that the person of the Word of God took up to himself our humanity and lived an authentically human life thereby. Prior to the advent of Jesus Christ, one could be forgiven for mistaking one's human nature with their human person. We had never seen someone for whom person and nature were not seemingly the same thing. But then along comes Jesus, who ruins our categories, and is a single person who has two natures. The implications of this are many. For one, you can say that God was born, that God has a mother, the Theotokos. You can say that God died. You can worship Jesus Christ precisely as the incarnate one, not peeking around his humanity to get to the good stuff. When you receive the Eucharist, you receive a person, not a nature, a who, and not simply a what. But Nestorius fails to see this. He is intent on keeping God safe from these radical implications. God died? God has a mother? Gross. His failure to understand what a person is makes nonsense of reading the gospel. Is it the man Jesus weeping outside the tomb of Lazarus, but his divinity who, embarrassed by this display of emotion, raises Lazarus so that the human nature of Jesus will stop crying? Or more horrifically, imagine what the cross is on Nestorius' account. The man Jesus Christ is tortured to death by the Romans, while the divinity remains present to him, cheering him on, but ultimately and literally having no skin in the game. The debate over Nestorius' Christology is not some arcane concern of bored 5th century intellectuals, or 21st century intellectuals for that matter. In fact, none of the Christological controversies can be reduced to such. They are all attempts at preserving the intelligibility of the biblical witness that God himself came among us as the man Jesus Christ. Put plainly, without a robust concept of person, we will misunderstand the gospel. Nothing less than that is at stake. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McManaway, Dr. Seahorn. Thank you, Father. Good morning, everybody. So um, it turns out that 20 minutes isn't very long, and I'm not sure how much of my title I really accomplished. So I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you all to part two of the talk, which will be next Saturday in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> what exactly is wrong with pagan worship? Leafing through the pages of the Bible and early Christian literature, we might immediately light upon at least three answers, and even leaving aside just having too many gods. That, that could be one. 
here are some others. The first is specific to image worship. The Bible often mocks the stupidity of worshiping human artifacts, and the fathers follow suit. Isaiah 44 serves as a good example with its memorable send-up of the man who cuts down a tree and then uses half the wood for a fire to warm himself and cook his food, and the other half to fashion an idol before which he falls in worship and supplication. Second, despite Israel's own cult involving animal, grain, and drink offerings, already in the Hebrew Bible we are taught that this is an accommodation to humanity for our sake, not a response to genuine divine necessity. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all that is in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Psalm 50. This too becomes a mainstay of early Christian apologetics. Third, the Bible frequently links idolatrous cult with moral turpitude, and all the early Christian apologists love to lampoon the behavior of Greco-Roman deities. Dramatic representation of their violent, duplicitous, and pornographic exploits made the public shows a no-fly zone for believers. These and similar objections are such ubiquitous tropes that they can sometimes appear to be lazy cheap shots that fail to take seriously the efforts of some pagans to distance their own teaching and worship from the crasser manifestations of Greco-Roman cult, acknowledging and addressing each of these stock concerns. Now, one counter-response to these efforts, offered most forcefully by Origen in the Contra Celsum and Augustine in the City of God, is that despite their professed recognition of the inadequacies and distortions of lowbrow paganism, the philosophers nonetheless failed to rescue the masses from their benightedness, something Moses and Jesus alone have done, and indeed were often happy enough to indulge in idolatrous worship as more or less a matter of theological indifference and as useful for civic virtue. What I hope to do in the rest of the paper is to contextualize these more obvious and perhaps shop-worn criticisms within a richer and deeper patristic analysis of true worship. Now, I'm going to make a number of claims about the fathers, supporting them with a necessarily small selection from a handful of authors. So I want to signal my awareness that the fathers are not monolithic, that they're all very complex, and so on and so forth. But I also do think that there are important common patterns that can be discerned beneath the diversity, yielding a flexible but real Catholicity of thought. End disclaimer, and here we go. It is right and just that Alexander Schmemann is frequently quoted and celebrated for his insight that the human being is, quote, homo sapiens, homo faber, yes, but first of all, homo adorans. More recently, in his deification through the cross, Khaled Anatolios has proposed a Christian soteriology predicated upon and responsive to what he terms a doxological anthropology. Scripture offers solid support. The biblical starting point for a theological anthropology is surely the claim of Genesis 126 that humanity is created in God's image and after God's likeness. It is highly significant that this teaching is embedded in the first of two creation stories, both of which evince a cultic sensibility. In short, both the cosmos as a whole, Genesis 1, and the Garden of Eden in particular, Genesis 2, are presented as temples in which humanity functions as both icon and priest. There are now a large number of excellent scholarly explorations of these themes in Genesis 1 and 2. David Fagerberg would thus seem to be on solid ground when he writes that, quote, Imago Dei is a liturgical description. As the image of God, man stands at the apex of visible creation to mediate God's descending love and creation's ascending worship, both currents fluxing through the human, close quote. If this doxological anthropology is right, then true worship is required for our genuine flourishing as human persons, and false worship is deformative of human persons and cultures. I would like to suggest that for the fathers of the church, True worship is anchored in and responsive to at least three things. First, the absolute transcendence of the one God, secured and confessed primarily through the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, so that there is a clear ontological hiatus between creator and creature. Second, the creation of humanity in the imago Dei, embedding within our human identity an invitation to divinization, and third, the recognition of divine revelation to God's chosen people, Israel, culminating in the incarnation of Christ and the gift of the Spirit as the means by which we are enabled to achieve theosis. So very simply, first, creation as a specification of God as beginning, 
divinization as a specification of God as the end, and then um, a kind of canonic or syncatabatic mediation, right, an economy of revelation, and for Christians, incarnation, uh, which specifies how God provides the means to the end. Christian worship responds to these convictions by, respectively, first, acknowledging God as absolute source and sustainer of all reality without exception, including the human person, something for which he is to be adored irrespective of any further action on his part. Second, understanding human glorification of God through Christ in the spirit as a graced participation in the mutual glorification of the persons of the Trinity, that's really Anatolios again, that is, as an entrance into the divine life, which is to say, deification. And third, resolutely submitting itself to divine revelation by shaping the eucological and liturgical forms and practices of Christian cult in accordance with the scriptures and traditions that transmit that revelation. All right, let's see if we can back this up in some texts. We'll start with Justin Martyr's trial in the 160s. Asked by the prefect Rusticus to specify the teaching of Christians, Justin replies that it is, quote, that according to which we worship the God of the Christians, whom we reckon to be one from the beginning, the maker and fashioner of the whole creation, visible and invisible. There's item one. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had also been preached beforehand by the prophets as about to be present with the race of men, the herald of salvation and teacher of good disciples. That's item three. Later on, Justin expresses his confidence in a heavenly reward. Rusticus presses Justin, do you suppose then that you will ascend into heaven and receive some recompense? And Justin answers, I do not suppose it, but I know and am fully persuaded of it. While theosis is not here explicit, item number two is implicitly present, I think, in Justin's hope. What Justin says at his trial maps rather neatly onto a passage he wrote some 10 years earlier in his first apology. After rejecting idolatry precisely along the biblical lines of the absurdity of worshiping human craftsmanship, Justin explains his own view of appropriate cult. But we have learned from tradition that God has no need of the material gifts of men since we see that he is the giver of all things. We have been taught, are convinced, and do believe that he approves of only those who imitate his inherent virtues, namely temperance, justice, love of man, and any other virtue proper to God who is called by no given name. We've also been instructed that God in the beginning created in his goodness everything out of shapeless matter for the sake of men. And if men by their actions prove themselves worthy of his plan, they shall, we are told, be found worthy to make their abode with him uh, and to reign with him free from all corruption and pain. Now, it's true that Justin appears to endorse creation, not ex nihilo, but from prime matter. Some have argued that his view is clarified in the second apology as, in fact, creation from nothing, but I'm not very persuaded. On balance, I think it's better to see Justin as the exception that proves the rule. His doctrine of creation, even if not ex nihilo, serves here in an explicitly cultic context to secure the genuine transcendence of God. All three criteria of true worship are then present. A God who's radically other, an invitation to theomimesis so that we can reign with him in immortality, all of which has been learned from tradition, that is, from the prophets and the apostles. Now, if Justin is fuzzy on the importance of creation ex nihilo, others were not. Whether or not the Bible teaches the doctrine is a complex question beyond the scope of this paper. That's called punting. But it is already clearly formulated in the very early Shepherd of Hermas, Justin's own disciplation teaches it forcefully in his address to the Greeks, and it thereafter quickly becomes de rigueur for patristic theology. Okay, let's turn now to Augustine. For Augustine, there are clearly doxological stakes in the question of creation from nothing. If we think of ourselves and all else as having already somehow supplied God with the raw material of potency, we reduce him to a demiurge who somehow needs us to make what we are. So that in Augustine's view, we can't fully praise him in the words of Psalm 103. Know that the Lord, he is God, it is he who made us, and in his version, and really all ancient versions, and not we ourselves. The point is, for Augustine, only a doctrine of creation ex nihilo can successfully establish the kind of gap between creator and creature requisite for authentic worship. Yet even the language of between is potentially misleading because of the nature of this gap. The point of insisting against pagans on God's ultra-transcendence is in part that there are limitations to picturing this transcendence in terms of distance. 
Augustine, following Ambrose, though Plotinus more often gets credit, speaks of God as ubique totus, rejecting any crass expression of distance as an adequate way to conceptualize God's transcendence. Right? That means he's everywhere whole. That is, this is not to say we can't say God is above us, certainly we can, but this must be qualified by an equal insistence on God's immediate intimate presence. Augustine puts them together famously in Confessions 3, tu autum eras interior intimo meo et superior sumo meo, both maximally interior and maximally superior. Yet in this passage, uh, this very passage, Augustine is describing a period in his life, namely his turn to Manichaeism, when he sees himself in retrospect as increasingly far from God, led gradually deeper into the depths of hell, that's the language he uses. The malice and ignorance that are the rotten fruit of pride, which is the ur sin, turn humanity away from the goodness and truth of God and thereby interrupt the program of deification inaugurated by creation in the image of God. The only solution for Augustine is the mediation of Christ, anchored in the incarnation and dispensed in the church through word and sacrament. Because God has, in his merciful condescension, spoken in human words, and because Jesus is both God and man, I won't venture into the proselyte language, the gap can, in a sense, be overcome without being, this is important, sorry, the gap can, in a sense, be overcome without being eradicated or even compromised. This simultaneous retention and overcoming of the ontological gap between creature and creator is what Christian theology calls grace the ineffable mystery of creaturely participation in the life of the transcendent God. But it is not a pure paradox, a just-so story that might dissolve into mere myth. Instead, it is the gift of creaturely receptivity precisely to God's mutually entailed transcendence and imminence. He's able to be utterly imminent because of his utter transcendence. By grace, creatures can become fully conformed and transparent to the transcendent imminence of God. Khaled Anatolio uh, felicitously, felicitously speaks of this as the enfolding of creaturely existence into the life of the creator God. It is just here that Augustine thinks that the Platonists fall short, as he, who are the best of the pagans, uh, at least in, in terms of theology. As he explains in Confession 7, the books of the Platonists did manage at least to approximate criteria one and two of Christian worship. They profess divine transcendence and they regard union with the divine as our aim. Yet their contempt for the created body prevents them from accepting the humility of the mediator, which is item three. They can, get, they can catch a glimpse of the homeland, but they cannot see the way home. For Augustine, this in turn damages the credibility of the philosopher's account of transcendence. They don't, in the end, recognize an ontological hiatus between God and ourselves. They see only a vast distance. At this point, we can turn back to the celebrated opening of the confessions and recognize again all three anchor points of true worship. You are great, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power, and to your wisdom there is no limit. And man who is a part of your creation wishes to praise you, man who bears about within himself his mortality, who bears about within himself testimony to his sin and testimony that you resist the proud. Yet man, this part of your creation, wishes to praise you. You arouse him to take joy in praising you, for you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Commenting on that last most famous of lines in the Confessions, Jared Ortiz writes, quote, the brief sentence, Ficistinos ad te, beautifully sums up the distinction and relation which creation establishes. Ficisti connotes a definitive ontological chasm between the creator God and his creation, there's item one, but God has also created human beings ad te, that is dynamically oriented back to the word and therefore to the whole trinity, in whom, through whom, and for whom they were made, and there's item two. Ortiz then offers a subtle but convincing interpretation of the singular heart that is restless. Quote, importantly, this heart is both individual and corporate. The core nostrum, the our heart of the opening lines uh, is Augustine's discreet way of referring to the Eucharistic liturgy, close quote. In Augustine's liturgy, the priest said not sursum corda, but sursum cor, lift up your heart collectively. This pregnant hint then brings with it the entire, and Augustine is referring to Sursum Cor constantly, so this is not some crazy overreading of the text, I don't think. This pregnant hint then brings with it the entire economy of revelation that underpins the Eucharistic liturgy, and there's item three. 
Okay, if we have more time, I'd want to show the very same principles at work in a slate of other patristic works. Instead, I'll turn briefly, that's part two next week. Uh, instead, I'll turn briefly to Ephraim the Syrian so that we'll at least have heard from representatives of all three major patristic languages, Greek, Latin, Syriac. Ephraim, as is well known, never tires of inveighing against what he calls investigation or prying into the mystery of God. His reason is not that God is unknowable, but that our methods of seeking God fail to respect the chasm, his word, between the creator and creation. Quote, whoever is capable of investigating becomes the container of what he investigates. This way lies idolatry, a turn to creatures that we in our pride mistake for God. And there's item one. But Ephraim, like, Just, like Justin and Augustine, thinks the gap has been bridged through divine revelation, which he prominently presents as an antidote for idolatry. In a hymn on the nativity, he writes, quote, the all-knowing saw that we worshiped creatures. He put on a created body to catch us by our habit, to draw us by a created body toward the creator. Blessed is he who contrived to draw us to him. There's item three. As for item number two, the goal of this revelation is divinization, something Ephraim develops in many works. Suffice, suffice it for our purposes to quote one couplet from the hymns on faith. He gave us divinity, we give him humanity, a great example of the famous exchange formula. What are the consequences of pagan worship that fall short of one or more of the elements of true worship? And this, is, this will be most of part two next week. I don't have a lot here, I'm almost out of time. The answer is distortion of human existence. This should be unsurprising if it is true that human beings are created in God's image and called to share in his life through true, true worship. Again, time constraints uh, preclude a full rehearsal of the many rather juicy passages from Justin Clement, Origen, Athanasius, Augustine, and others that we could bring in here. I'll stick with just one from Ephraim. In the homily on our Lord, the only one of Ephraim's prose memre to survive, we read, Quote, the nations confess you because your word became a mirror before them in which they might see hidden death devouring their lives. Idols are ornamented by those who craft them, but they disfigure their crafters with their ornamentation. And a few lines later, this is, this is kind of this is kind of cool stuff. Dead idols with closed mouths fed on the life of their worshipers. For this reason, you, he's speaking to Christ, mixed your blood, which repelled death and terrified it in the bodies of your worshipers, so he's referring to the Eucharist, so that the mouths of those who consume them would be repelled by their life. Unbeknownst to idolaters, their worship was devouring them. The Eucharist, as true worship, restores them to life and affects this kind of inversion. Okay, I'll conclude by suggesting that whatever translation they might require, patristic analyses of true and false worship remain pastorally relevant today. Early in Vatican II's Gaudium et Spes, we find lengthy lamentations, uh, I mean, it's a very 1965 document, no doubt about it, um, of the many social and existential maladies of the modern world. Uh, I don't think things have gotten better since 65 either. Um, but maybe less well known is Gaudium et Spes 13 offers the following diagnosis. Although he was made by God in a state of holiness, from the very onset of his history, man abused his liberty at the urging of the evil one. Man set himself against God and sought to attain his goal apart from God. And then we have Romans 1 on idolatry. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, but their senseless minds were darkened and they served the creature rather than the creator. What divine revelation makes known to us agrees with experience. Examining his heart, man finds that he has inclinations toward evil too, and is engulfed by manifold ills which cannot come from his good creator. Often refusing to acknowledge God as his beginning, man has disrupted also his proper relationship to his own ultimate goal, so there's items two and one, as well as his whole relationship toward himself and others and all created things. Therefore, man is split within himself. So, according to Vatican II, the psychological and social ills of modern existence are traceable to a failure of true worship. The eminent patristic scholar Robert Louis Wilkin would seem to agree. In an article published 30 years ago to the month, November 93, Wilkin draws on patristic sources, he focuses on the Contra Celsum of origin, to mount a case for a renewed emphasis on true worship. Quote, it is time to return to first principles, to the first commandment. 
and to take up anew the challenge faced by Christians many centuries ago when the Christian movement was first making its way in the Roman Empire. Christians are now called to persuade others, including many within the churches, including many within the churches, that our first duty as human beings, right, precisely as human beings, is to honor and venerate the one true God. And that without the worship of God, society disintegrates into an amoral aggregate of competing self-centered interests destructive of the common wheel. Tell us what you really think. Um, with the worship of God, however, this is me now, that's end quote. With the worship of God, however, we are enabled to realize our calling as persons in communion with one another and with our maker. As Augustine puts it in the city of God, we owe worship, quote, only to him who is the true God, who makes his worshipers gods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Seahorn. I think we can all really appreciate how rich thinking about personhood is in the first five centuries of Christianity and the debates therein. Um, before I turn the floor open to questions, I just want to give one last call. Is, is Pablo Irizar, did he happen to? Nope. All right, well, we'll hope he's here for a future DCEC conference. Um, he, can in, he can come for part two next week, which will be in Denver at the Augustine Institute. All right, it's my pleasure now to turn things over to, to all of you for questions. You can ask to either or both of our speakers. Um, my only request is that can you wait to um, pose your question until one of our event staff bring a microphone to you so that way the recording uh, has your voice in it um, for, the, for the digital record of this session. Okay, so just be patient with that. When you receive the microphone, please uh, introduce yourself and what institution you're coming from, okay? Start us off, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lewis Pearson from the University of St. Francis. Uh, Dr. Seahorn, I had a question about uh, something you mentioned, uh, sacrifice being already a, a Hebrew, Hebrew sacrifice already being a, an accommodation for our weakness. Um, how sacrifice does or doesn't fit into these three essential elements for true worship? Thanks. Um, that's a really good question. I probably, I probably should have given some thought beforehand to, um, to how to answer that, right? So um, uh, insofar as sacrifice is a constituent element of the kind of, I, I refer to a canonic or syncatabatic, right? An economy of condescension uh, by which God initiates um, a kind of uh, crossing of the ontological gap in order to bring us into, um, into communion, um, then I suppose it would, it would belong to item number three. Um, nonetheless, I mean, one of the convictions of, um, of the fathers and, and really of, um, I think, most of the Judeo-Christian tradition um, is that, that all of these items that are part of the economy, um, even those that can seem very obscure, actually means something permanent, right? Um, and that, that's true even when they are sort of things that are accommodations to particular times and places. Of course, this is a major thing that, you know, the early church is working out with respect to um, the judicial, what Aquinas eventually will call the judicial and ceremonial laws uh, in Torah, right? Um, but there's, there's a really wonderful passage in, um, I think it's in book two, in book two of um, Origen, Origins Peri Archon on, on First Principles, where he actually sort of is speculating about um, the post-mortem experience. And, and um, you know, he, he like, Origen was like us. We, he loves school. And so he sort of thinks of it as this um, ongoing uh, process of learning and specifically learning the meaning of every detail of the economy. I think one of the examples he gives is, you will learn why there were 24 courses of Levites. Right? You'll learn the meaning of, the, of every biblical name, that every single one of these things somehow mysteriously discloses something about the transcendent mystery of God. Right? And so that, um, the, to, to say that it's an accommodation is not sort of um, just to relegate it to a sort of purely provisional status. Right? Um, now, in the case of sacrifice, of course, um, Christians are working with a pretty rich theology of uh, interpreting sacrifice uh, especially from uh, the epistle to the Hebrews, right? Um, and it's, its use of Psalm 40, um, and that, that really the meaning of uh, a sacrifice is to be understood in these sort of relational terms. Now, from there, we'd have to kind of like branch out into the different kinds 
of uh, Levitical sacrifice, um, and even into um, you know how to how to think about uh, the liturgical, the Jewish liturgical cycle, and so on and so forth. But um, I'm, I'm not sure how much more you'd want to hear. <laughs> so thank you for that. Hello, um, I'm Cameron from Spring Arbor University. Um, I have a question for Mr. Uh, McManaway. Um, so I walked in a little bit late, so I, I do want to ask a clarifying question before I actually get to my real question. In, um, in what you were talking about, would you say you're advocating for like that Jesus took up his humanity, but within that humanity it did not include human's nature, but rather human personhood? Is that what you were advocating for? No, no. Uh, and I'm not really advocating for anything. I'm just kind of describing Nestorius. Um, but oh, I, I, I would say, yeah, so for me, uh, the word is the, the, the person of the Logos is the, the term of the incarnation. That's the suppositum. That's where the incarnation happens, that the Logos takes to himself a human nature and becomes human thereby. But he doesn't take up a man or something. He doesn't take up another individual. Okay, that, that clarifies okay. what I need to ask then. Thank you. Oh, great. You, you can. Let me, let me just make sure, is it on this, on this point? Yeah. Uh, all, right, all right. I'm going to let our, our panelists ask questions of panelists. All right, John, go it's ahead. <laughs> Dr. McManaway, thank you for your excellent talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a joke. It was great. Uh, <laughs> no, the, uh, I'm actually really uh, th grateful for this question, Cameron. Um, and Josh, I'd like to ask you uh, your view about this. So um, there's a kind of... Um, uh, Greek patristic dictum that uh, is usually ascribed to Greg of Nazianzus, but I would have you all know that since the 40s, we've known that it was uh, actually first articulated by Origen, at least as far as we know. I like Origen, so I always have to stand up for him. Um, uh, which, is, which is the following, that th there's a kind of soteriological principle about the incarnation that that which is not assumed is not healed, is not redeemed, right? And so, um, so the word must have assumed to himself an integral humanity, everything that we are, he becomes, without sin, but, but I mean, sin doesn't exactly make us more human, right? Um, and so, um, and people worry about this sometimes. Um, so anyway, what, what's the point? The point is, well, what about personhood, right? So this is actually really relevant to our conference. If we don't say that Christ assumed a human person, then how can he redeem us precisely as persons, right? And, um, and one of the one of the treatments I've seen of this that I find really interesting is um, Aaron Rich's book, um, Ecce Homo, on the divine unity of Christ. Uh, and and toward the end of the book, he sort of confronts this question, and he proposes actually a kind of Mariological answer to this, which is that in the creed we confess that Christ uh, became flesh, um, ex Maria Virgine, right? And and this establishes a kind of um, really profound actually kind of hypostatic relation between them, even though she's not the mother of, um, of the word according to his divinity, she enters into a, uniquely a unique kind of personal relationship with the son. Well, if you sort of put that in conversation with um, especially 20th century resistance to a kind of like, uh, re reductively substantialist account of personhood, and instead opt for a more relational account, then, then Riches suggests that, that maybe um, we can see the relationship, and you can think about all the iconography that emphasizes the relationship between uh, the mother of God and the divine son, right? That this is sort of a way to approach um, how it is that Christ can redeem our personhood even though he doesn't have a sort of self-standing human personhood. So I'm, I'm curious whether you've given any thought. Sorry, that was a really long question. It was, it was a lecture, I apologize. No, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I have not, like, I, it's been years since I've read Aaron's book, um, so it's, it's not something I've, I've thought about, but the, the relationship thing. Yeah, and, and just to, to, you've said it well, I'll just make one other point that Nestorius's Christology leads him into a different soteriology. He doesn't have a soteriology whereby Christ assuming our human nature heals human nature. For him, salvation is moral overcoming of the devil's claims on humanity, right? And so this one individual, Jesus Christ, finally does what Adam was supposed to do, which is live a moral life. And he does so because he's supercharged. Pardon? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's sympathetic to them, right? Um, 
yeah, it, so you have a kind of different soteriology there because, right, Nestorius could not imagine anything otherwise. I mean, there's no, there's no taking up of our nature into the life of the Trinity to, to heal it. Um, and so all, you've, all you're left with is moral progress. Thank you. Let me, are there any other questions from out in the, the audience? Yes, Dr. Oakes. Thank you, my name is Ken. I'm here at the University of Notre Dame. Josh, I have some like Christological 101 questions, if that's gonna be okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I enjoyed so much your retention of, the, of prosopon and prosopon, I thought that was very clear. I really liked the analogy of like two X's into an X, I really liked that. I thought that was all very clear. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first is about Nestorius. What then is the difference of the man Jesus to anybody else? Anybody else in humanity? What then is the difference of this person to anyone else? And this is a little bit off topic, but the, would Cyril say then that like the hypothesis of the word becomes composite or is composite? Even if he doesn't necessarily like use that language, do you think that that is actually what he's kind of implying? Okay, this is, this is really good. So first question, what's the difference between Jesus and the rest of us schmucks, right? It's simply that the human being has a super abundance of God's presence to him, which in the eschaton will be fully realized in all of us. So that the hope is that if we traverse this kind of moral path, we also will end up where Jesus is. But he's, he's an exemplar in that respect. Um, now, some 20th century scholars of Nestorius who tried to kind of rehabilitate him and make him say, you know, make him not to be a Nestorian, they tried to say, well, you know, it's, yes, it is a, a, um, a difference of quantity, but you have to envision a difference of quantity that somehow becomes a difference of quality. And I just thought, no, you don't. That's a bad <laughs> argument. It's just a difference of quantity. It's just that, G that God is super present to, to Jesus. In the same way, says Nestorius, that God was present to Adam, right? So there's, there's little difference between the prosopon of Adam and the, the human prosopon of Jesus in that respect. Um, secondly, would Cyril uh, say that Jesus is um, composite? Um, so I mentioned Cyril a lot in here because he's kind of the one everyone knows as Nestorius' nemesis. You know, they're back and forth. He's writing in Greek. But I went the other way in my own research, right? I, I focused on how Latins, so I, how Latins responded to Nestorius. So I don't know Cyril's corpus super well. Um, you know, his, his miaphusis, his like one nature or whatever, sometimes does get, I think, construed as, uh, as though he, he thinks of Christ as a kind of composite. Um, but Hans van Loon wrote a really, really good and compelling book years ago uh, titled The Diophysite Christology of Cyril of Alexandria. And I think he shows um, that, yeah, th that Cyril is a thoroughgoing diophysite. Um, he just, he stresses the unity of the person, right? But it's, it's the person of the word who has idiosarchs, his own flesh, right? And Nestorius can't say that. Um, is Cyril, sure, he has instrument language that the, the, the human Jesus is the instrument of the logos or whatever, but you find that in Orthodox Christologies, right? There is an instrumentality to the body of Jesus, that's fine. Um, but... Yeah, I think, I think Cyril is a, is a diophysite. He just has a more radical account of personhood that allows for him to locate the incarnation in the person of the Logos instead of Team Jesus, you know, buddy cop movie, human Jesus, divine <laughs> word coming together to overcome the devil. Yeah. Thank yeah. yeah. Thank you. Are, this side of the room, I just want to offer, I didn't glance over here. Are there, are, yes, please. But uh, just to wait for the microphone. Thank you both. Uh, I'm Javier Samuelson from Arizona State. <clears throat> so I'm going to pose the question to both of you. Maybe you can help me here. Now, it's not fair to think in terms of counterfactuals in history. There are no counterfactuals in history, but I will do precisely that. If we stayed in Hebrew, would the whole conversation evolve? Um, I'll ask you, Josh, first. What would be Usia in Hebrew? So I don't know what it would be in Hebrew. In Syriac, in a dialect of Aramaic, it's Kiono, is what Nestorius prefers, or, or rather what his interpreters prefer when they're translating his text into Syriac. I'm trying to, to figure out, because the, the dynamics in the Hebrew language is different. So yes. some, what happens here is the shift from the Hebrew to the Greek, 
Uh, and I was surprised, John, in your presentation, why you didn't pay more attention to Philo, who helps us with the interpretation of the biblical text to make the shift from the Hebrew to the Greek. But that, to me, is maybe why Ephraim is saying what he's saying, because he's closer to the Hebrew than to the Greek, Does that, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, I mean, Philo should probably be part three. Uh, <laughs> I mean, even though he is, the fathers will call him our Philo, I did, I did think about Philo, um, but, but I, I, I just wanted to stick with, um, with fathers for, for the particular scope of this one. Um, but that's right. I mean, um, I think, and I think what's, uh, what's especially important about Philo, I mean, I, I find um, like David Dawson and others persuasive on this point that a lot of times people, people, um, approach uh, Philo, it's kind of like the way they do with origin, as a kind of wannabe philosopher who's a biblical exegete on the side. Um, and I don't think that's right, right? Um, I, don't think that, I don't think that Philo is actually, at the end of the day, um, someone who is um, going to be kind of um, attracted to Celsus's view, for example, where you have the kind of Alethes Logos Club, like right-thinking philosophers, because Celsus is very happy to, to welcome Jews to that table because they're ancient, because, I mean, Numenius calls them, you know, a race of philosophers, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so people read Philo, the point is they read Philo as trying to make um, Torah, like, acceptable to Hellenistic thinkers. I think what he's doing is much more ambitious, which is trying to show that the divine revelation of Torah um, actually satisfies and fulfills and, and transcends all of the best in Hellenistic culture. And so in that sense, it's, um, it's maybe not so different from, uh, ironically enough, from something that somebody like Justin Martyr is trying to do with um, the, the, um, the Logoi Spermaticoi, right? That, um, that there are sort of seeds of the logos all around. And, and just, by the way, if I have more time to kind of talk about the contemporary situation, it seems to me that the kind of um, structural framework, theological structural framework in Nostra Aetate uh, from Vatican II, and then also in some of the work of people like Danielu and Bouillet um, on, um, on sort of natural religion, pagan religion, um, is a really useful thing to sort of bring in here that um, um, to think, in other words, to think not about um, a bunch of religions in a bucket and then having criteria for which ones are good and which ones are bad, but to think about what constitutes vera religio, right, as a virtue, and then think about different ways that that can be either um, uh, realized or, or distorted. So that is not what you asked me. I, I said something about Philo and then dodged. <laughs> because I wasn't ready for that. Thank you for that question. Other questions? Yes, go ahead, please. My name is Todd. I serve on the faculty at Indiana Wesleyan. I have a question that's probably more for Joshua, but probably for both of you, given some of the comments you were making, John, toward the end of your paper. And I'm going to admit it's somewhat of an unwieldy question here. But what are the ramifications of orthodox and heretical commitments about Christ's nature for how we understand the church as Christ's body and for its members being created in Christ's image? So, again, the unwieldy part is, you know, it sort of arcs 2,000 plus years here necessarily, but, you know, heresy, if it's like a virus, it just mutates. And do we see different forms of this today in terms of how we think about the church and in terms of of how we think about each other, we just might not recognize it necessarily as, say, Nestorianism in just a new or variant form. Yeah, so. this is a really thoughtful question, thank you. Um, it's the kind of question that I wish you had written me in an email three weeks ago, and then I could think about it and just come out here with an excellent answer. No, no, I'm, I'm the one who's late. Yeah, I, so one of, one of the, the things I think is just when I think of patristic ecclesiology, okay, there's no, there's no patristic text, De Ecclesia. They don't write treatises on the church. They just write about Christ, and it's like, the church is also what we're talking about, by the way. Um, you know, Augustine's homilies on 1 John are a really good example of this. But, you know, for Nestorius, if you're going to cash out his, his Christology in an ecclesiological register, what do you have? You know, hopefully, you just have a, a bunch of people who are super virtuous, right? But now this really puts the 
the burden, I think, on us to make the church, right? Is the, when we say in the creed, the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic, am I saying I can look out at the sum total virtue of the people uh, you know, amongst, in the congregations and like, okay, sufficient holiness for me to say it this Sunday. Well, on Nestorius's account, yes, you'd have to, right? Because what Christianity is, is moral progress. Um, whereas I think, you know, on a kind of orthodox Christology, uh, where the word himself takes up human nature, heals it thereby, and incorporates us, us into the life of the Trinity, and everything that we are in that economy is done by God's grace, that also means the church is by God's grace. Um, and that when we can say that she's holy and one and Catholic and apostolic, etc., we're not kind of holding our fingers behind our back. We mean it. We just mean it differently than uh, this is a sociological survey I've done. So. I don't know. No, there, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's an enormous amount to say about that, right? I mean, so um, Augustine is sort of probably who we're likely to go to first. <clears throat> um, and his, his sort of development of the idea of the totus Christus. Um, you know, and even, I, I do think that it's there in some of the Greeks that they, in a way, maybe they didn't <clears throat> fully articulate, you know, so like uh, in, in the third oration against the Arians, Athanasius has this thing like, we, we all know in scripture there's a double account, right? So sort of Christ as logos, and then not Christ as man, Christ as God-man, Christ as logos made flesh. Um, so it's sort of like by way of addition, not just parceling out. That's why he's not an historian. Uh, very clear about that in, in that oration, actually. Um, okay, so, um, but then Athanasius himself also sort of extends that. So actually, Bouyer wrote a great work that um, I don't think has ever been translated. Uh, it's, it's, it's something like um, uh, the, the word in Christ's church. It's, it puts together word, incarnate word, and the mystery of Christ in the church, something like that. But, but his point is, um, is really sort of showing how Athanasius is also thinking ecclesially about the whole body of Christ in these sort of Pauline terms. Um, okay, but how do, and then Augustine, of course, makes it very clear. So like there, he has a sermon, uh, Sermon 341, where he actually just says there are three ways to talk about Christ, right? As, as God, um, as God made man, and as like God man church, so like Christ living in his members. Um, so in some ways, if you're going to be able to do that well without sort of falling into like the virtue club uh, or something like that, it actually it actually might you might want something more than a just sort of um, even if it's like asymptotically quantitative, but something more than a, than a, than a difference of degree between Christ and the church. So precisely so you have something to anchor that in the reality of God, right? I mean, that's really what these fourth century debates are about, is does the son, is he actually able to bring us not closer to the father or like, you know, orient us toward the father, but do we have access to the father? Okay, so... Um, so that's, that's a question I'd ask, but I think this is a really complicated one, and I don't think I have an answer, because um, you know, when we speak about the mystical body of Christ, you're like, that sounds really nice. What does mystical mean, right? And it's very clear something less than a hypostatic or substantial union, but it's also very clearly something more than a moral union. So it seems to me that, I mean, my, I, I haven't done this work, but my inclination would, would be to start looking at different sort of models of thinking about participation, right? And, and really the place to go on this is like Norman Russell uh, on deification and so on and so forth. What are, the different, what are the different models that are available to us to think about creaturely, creaturely metochi um, or participation in, um, in the divine life? And that, that that might be something that helps us specify what this mystical thing is that is strong enough, as Augustine loves to remind us, that in Acts 9, uh, Jesus doesn't say, like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my followers? Why are you persecuting my church? He says, why are you persecuting me, right? So um, I guess thank you for the question, and I join you in asking it. Yeah. We have time perhaps only for one more if there is yet a final question. or we'll, we'll call it at that. Um, it's a really terrific privilege to think about personhood in the way that we might be created for worship, um, rightly so, and how it is that the person of Christ helps to redefine this entire project, not only for individual human persons, but also the corporate membership of his body. 
Please join me in thanking both of our speakers for very rich interventions this morning.